Well, good morning, everyone. What a wonderful time of year this is in many ways, isn't it? We can keep our focus upon the right things, can't we? Incarnation Day. Think about it. The day that the Lord came to make a way for each of us to have a way of escape. What a blessing. As we begin this morning, I'd like to ask Homer if you would be uh, gracious enough to open us in a word of prayer, please, this morning, brother. Amen. <clears throat> if you would please open your Bibles again to uh, John chapter 1 as we're continuing our study in the Gospel of John. What a blessing this Gospel is. I certainly am a study and I think to everyone. We're going to begin our scripture reading this morning in John chapter 1. And we're going to begin in verse 10. We're just going to read a few verses and we'll be working our way through this a little bit this morning. Uh, but before we start, I'd just like to remind everybody about the Gospel of John. Just think about it for a few moments. This is a wonderful Gospel in the sense that it really is designed to help us to see the deity of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and at the very same time His humanity. Understand that He was a 100% God He was a 100% man. And in His humanity He came into this world. He came into this world so that we can identify with Him and that He could identify with us. But we have a God that we can actually know what a blessing that is to think about. You know, he's not just some abstract God, something that's sort of out there, but he is, of course, all of those things too. But more than that, he was a, he was a God that came and made a way of escape for each and every one of us. Our scripture reading is going to begin in, in verse 10 of John 1. And it says, He was in the world, and the world was made by him, and the world knew him not. He came unto his own, and his own received him not. But as many as received him, to them he gave power to become the sons of God. I'm sorry, I, I may have I've jumped up here. He came unto his own, his own knew him not. But as many as received him, to them he gave the power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe in his name, which were born, please notice, not of blood, nor the will of the flesh, nor the will of man, but of God. And the word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. I don't know, you have to be a little older and have been uh, around for quite a while to know a, a man, a Bible teacher, a man had written a number of books, uh, was pretty big back in the uh, mid part of the 1900s, a man by the name of uh, Major Ian Thomas. Anybody recognize that name? Yeah, a few do. And Ian Thomas, he was just a a real man, really on fire for the Lord, a real, just had a real, real testimony. But at the Moody Bible Ten Institute one year, he, he said these words, and he was well known for his quotations. He came up with these various things. I thought it was good in my studies, and I thought I'd bring this out to us this morning. He said this, he said, he, speaking of course of Christ, had come as he came in order to be what he was. He had to be what he was in order to, to do what he did. And he had to do what he did so we might have what he has. We have to have what he has in order to be what he is. Now, we think about that just a minute. But you know, he went on and defined that to help us out a little bit. Here's what it really means. He went on to explain it this way. He says, he had to come as, as he came. That means he had to come being born of a virgin. We're just getting ready to, uh, to worship him in that, in that sense. In order that, that, that uh, in order to be what he was, a perfect man inhabited by God. He had to be what he was in order to do what he did, die and to redeem us. He had to do what he did so, he might have what, so, so we might have what he has, his life, all that was lost in Adam. And we have to have what he has in order to be what he was, perfect, the man, man, man inhabited by God. You know, my friends, that really is what the Gospel of John is all about, isn't it? Isn't it really about that? Of, of kind of expanding on that? It was kind of a simple way of saying it. Now in John 14, we begin again, in, I mean John 1, in, in verse 14 it says, And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory. The glory is the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. We beheld the glory as the only begotten of the Father. In other words, Jen, J Jesus was 
was sinlessly born, physically begotten of God, and about God uh, and about him the glory of perfection and the glory of perfect wisdom, and of course the glory of absolute purity. These are all what we could see in our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. In verse 15, it goes on to say, John bare witness of him and cried, saying, this was, of, this was he of whom I spake. He that cometh after me is preferred before me, for he was before me. John 16, I mean, verse 16 goes on to say, and of his fullness have we all received grace for grace. Oh, what a blessing that verse is. Grace for grace. Think about that. Grace for grace. It's grace the sum total of all the attributes and the power of, 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 of God. All of that was all in Christ. In Hebrews 1.23 it says, which is his body, the fullness of him that fulfilled all in all. It grace for grace. We see grace literally piled upon grace as the experiences we experience in our, in our Christian life. As a child of God, each spiritual blessing that we, that we appropriate becomes the foundations of even greater blessings. It's a wonderful thing when we begin to think about what we have, the type of grace that we have today. For the, for the child of God, each spiritual blessing we appropriate becomes the foundation of even greater blessings, and God's grace is never-ending. And the more we have, the more we receive. It's opposite of what really we have in the world, isn't it? Most things that we have, the more we use them, the less there is to use. We're going to use them up at some point. But you know, God's grace is just the opposite. The more we have, the more we appropriate that in our lives, the greater the grace comes in our lives, and the more there is to continue to appropriate. We can continue to grow and just grow and grow in, in grace and truth. It's such a blessing to consider these things. In the Old Testament, I don't believe those prophets could even ever imagine the grace that we can enjoy today. Yes, they knew about grace, but they didn't know it as abundantly as we do today. And the power of it that we have in our lives today. Yes, God's grace is never ending. Oh, what a blessing it is. Grace literally is, is the kindness and the love of God, of, of the love of God, our Savior, toward man. Not of works of righteousness that we've ever done. Most of us understand that. In Titus 3.3, 3, it says, For we ourselves also were sometimes foolish, disobedient, deceived, deserving, uh, I mean, serving uh, diver to lust, lust and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hate, hateful, and, having, and, and hating one another. But after that kindness and love of God, our Savior, toward man appeared, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us by the washing of regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Spirit, which he hath shed on us abundantly through Jesus Christ our Savior, that being justified by his grace, we should not be heirs according to the hope of eternal life. Isn't that a blessing? Isn't that a blessing to understand that? Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. Here, like it is in Paul's writings, Christ is... To displace is the law of Moses. That's one of the things that we learn throughout this dispensation, throughout the New Testament. You know, as we see that uh, Moses, as he revealed that way of life, we have a brand new type of life that we have through grace. In John 17, in verse 17, it goes on to say, for the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. Please notice the word, when we look at this, it says the law was given by Moses. But John says, grace and truth by Jesus Christ. The law was what? It was given, wasn't it? It was given. But grace and truth, it came. It came in a physical person. It came. Now, it's important to understand that grace is never at the expense of truth, is it? We don't ever sacrifice truth for grace. That's wrong, isn't it? With Jesus Christ, we have both. And we have both of those absolutely perfectly. In perfect harmony. In perfection. Yes, we see this demonstrated in His very character. Certainly, Jesus Christ was the most balanced person in this entire world that ever walked, wasn't He? He was God. He was perfect in everything. 
And his ministry was absolutely perfect. And his words in his ministry were perfected as well. There was grace, there was love, and there was instruction. And there was condemnation too, wasn't there? There was all of these things in there perfectly given and perfectly given rightly that we might truly know and see God in the flesh and understand better the person and, 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 and who our Lord was. Yes, the law of Moses also, it, it contained truth, didn't it? But it was sharp, it was demanding, it was penetrating. It, it embodied, it was embodied in the Decalogue. And it actually, it exp expanded into some 613 different edicts or edicts of the law, eventually. That was a lot to keep track of, wasn't it? Wasn't it? That would have been pretty tough. We see that. Yes, the law of Moses did embody grace. But we found out that failure to keep the, the moral law necessitated the giving of the ceremonial law so that guilt could be covered. And keep in mind, the Old Testament, it was simply covered. With Jesus Christ, it's taken away. With the Lord, all we confess our sins, they are as removed as far as the east is from the west, aren't they? We know that. We know that it's done. When we, when we have come to, to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ and we receive Him as our Lord and Savior, can we ever go back to, can we ever go back to being unsaved? No. Why? It's a gift of God, isn't it? It doesn't anything to do with us, does it, at that point? So what a blessing. Ours is a one-time one deal. But, the, the, of course, the living is a different challenge as we live the experiential uh, life that we should live. Yes, we see the failure to keep the moral law necessitated to give the ceremonial law so that it could cover guilt, the guilt could be covered, until we come to the time of Calvary. Then we come to Calvary. Grace is, is not only a dispensational method of dividing or, or, or divine dealing in salvation, but also the method of, God's, of, of God in the believer's life and service. As saved, as we're saved, he is not under the law. If you're here as a child of God, and you're saved, but you're under grace. Romans 6.14 says, For sin shall not have dominion over you, for ye are not under the law, but under grace. The dispensation we live in this, this time in the day has nothing to do with the law to, uh, anymore, does it? We live in a dispensation of grace. Completely different. Whether you be Jew or Gentile, we're all saved the same way. And what we have is so much greater than anything that, is ever, that they've ever had in the past. What a blessing it is. As the Old Testament pointed to the Messiah's coming and the blessings that were to come, it was kind of a veiled thing that they were looking at and seeing. As man continued, as Israel continued to fail, and God kept showing his, his mercy and his grace to Israel, giving them opportunity upon opportunity, but no man can ever keep the law. But by grace and truth, we have been made righteous in the sight of God, haven't we? Our righteousness is not based upon me. It's not based upon you. It's based upon my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And if you're here as a child of God today, that's where your righteousness is as well. You have been made perfected before God because of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And what a great, what a blessing this is. But it was not until grace and truth actually kind of inherited into the law could be, and could be actually implemented into a, a, a perilous life. In other words, a life that we're, where we have actually would be an uncomprehensible type life where nothing could ever match that. And thus to be translated into a language uh, that, that, that we all can understand. As a person, we can understand God so much more, can't we? We can see Him. We can understand Him. We can hear His words. We can know that our God, when He walked in this world, felt and tasted and hungered and suffered, understood what it was to be hated for doing righteous things. He knew all of these things. He went through them all. He knew them all before He ever came into the world. He knew what was going to happen to Him before He ever came into the world. He knew each and every one of us before the world even existed, didn't he? And yet he was still willing to do all of that for us, for you and I. What a blessing. What a blessing it is to know that as a child of God that we can have confidence in all of these things. Christ was visible, understandable, and he was identifiable. 
we could actually identify with him in the flesh. Isn't that a blessing? No other God that you ever, no other, there is no other gods, is there? But all the other gods that all the other ones actually worship, what kind of gods are they? They're stone, they're wood, they're this, they're that. But they are gods that are, that are, that, that are not ones that they can identify with in any way, really, can they? They're, they're somewhat of an abstract god. They're false gods. There's only one true God, and that, that, and that is the Lord Jesus Christ. Of course, God the Father, God the Son. So we see that. In Christ, we see grace and truth, and we see it wrapped up so warmly and vibrantly in human flesh, brought into this world by Jesus, the man, and Christ, the Messiah. Both at the same time. 100% God, 100% man, all at the same time. He was. He set aside his glory. He never set aside his deity. What a picture of love is that? What a picture of love is that? We're about to celebrate his birth. Think of how he humbled himself to come into the world the way he did. He didn't come in as a great king and great power and just take over the world, did he? He humbled himself to the most meager of, of things, the type of existence that he lived. Such a humble and simple life. Yes, what a love that he has for us. And keep in mind the whole time knowing what was going to happen before it ever happened. Because God knows all things, doesn't he? He knows the end from the beginning, or the beginning from the end, right? He knows it all. We see that Peter emphasizes, for example, God's grace. He went about, as Peter keeps telling us, he says how much good God always was doing, how much good our Savior, how much good... Jesus Christ was continuously doing. Think about it. He was healing the sick. He was giving sight to the blind. He was raising the dead. He was curing leprosy. He was doing so many things outwardly. He was feeding people. And they all think how wonderful that was. But the greatest feeding of all was His very Word. The spiritual feeding. The understanding of what it was to never thirst or never hunger again. Because he was the Word. And he was showing man how you could, once again, have what we had lost with Adam. Yes, grace, through grace we see in verse 17, through grace was manifest in the Old Testament. It was literally like a candle compared to the bright grace that appears at the Incarnation. What we see today in the place that we have been placed by God's grace in this world is such a wonderful time. And we won't spend much on that. I say it all the time. But think about your own lives, my friends. The wonderful time that, we've been, that, we have been, that we have been blessed to be born in. Everyone here this morning most likely owns a Bible. We have the very Word, His very Word in our hand, and we can read it. We've been taught how to read. We know how to understand it. We can read it and enjoy it. We can grow in it. We can have Him at any time we want. Through the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, if you're here as a child of God this morning, you had the third person of the Trinity living within you to help you understand the Word of God, but also to lead, guide, and direct in your life. We also have access to the throne room of God at any moment, of any time, day or night. We can simply say, Abba, Father, and go right into His presence and make our requests known unto Him directly. Oh, we live in such a wonderful time through the, through the incarnation of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and in Him coming into this world and making a way for each and every one of us. And we found that some of the examples would be, for example, in Genesis 6-8 when it says, but Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. And that's all capital, meaning Jehovah. And again, before Moses, and, and giving, when he was giving the Ten Commandments in, in Exodus 34 when he said, and the Lord passed before him and proclaimed, the Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abundant in goodness and truth. Here again, we see the grace of God, even in the Old Testament, in so many different ways. We see the promise of, of the restoration of the ten tribes of Israel that was given to Jeremiah again. In the, Jeremiah 31, 2, it says, Then said the Lord, the people which are left of the, of the sword found grace in the wilderness. Even Israel, when I went to cause him to rest, the Lord appeared of the old 
unto me, saying, Yea, I have loved thee with an everlasting love, therefore with, with loving kindness have I drawn these. We see, for the, for the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth truly came through Jesus Christ. And that's the point that, that John is making here. The description and the demonstration, the fullness of grace announced by John the Baptist and brought by Jesus Christ. God the Word, Jesus Christ, brought a different order than the one that had been instituted before through the law, through Moses. My friends, remember as we talk here where we're at in history, when John is writing this epistle, it is after the destruction of Israel. It's after the, after the scattering of the Jews. It's after all that they had experienced and the marvelous ministry that our Lord had had in this world. And his apostles and those that have proclaimed and the many things that were done to show and prove that he was who he said he was. And yet he was still rejected. He was still rejected. So my friends, we need to keep these things in mind. And when we think about that, we only can think like we mentioned a week or two ago when we are talking about, as we started this, of how John must have thought. John, just thinking about this, he experienced, he saw this, and he was just, in a sense, in, in, in awe that, that there could still be this type of attitude when they had had such an experience and what they had seen and had had time to repent and come back and get right with God. And they hadn't done it. And they hadn't done it. Of course, we know this opened up the church age and it began a whole new thing. We'll get into that later, but that's not where we're at today. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. Christ displays, displaces the law of Moses as the, as the focus of divine revelation and the way of life. No more law, but grace. This is the dispensation of grace. No one has seen God at any time, the Bible tells us. Jesus, the Word, is the perfect declaration of the unseen God, the Father and Son are one. And Jesus has declared the nature of the unseen God. It's through Him that we see Him declared. We don't have to wonder about the nature and personality of God. Jesus has declared it, both in His teaching and in His life. Grace is the unmerited favor of God. We think about that. We use that term so often. What is grace? Well, grace is God's unmerited favor, right? But what does that really mean? Think about all that it really encompasses. We think about it, we should see the fact that grace is the basis of our very salvation, isn't it? It's by God's grace that we're saved here today. Our salvation is a great miracle in and of itself. That's a big miracle. That our, we can be turned from death that we deserve, from a life though that we've had, and be re-entered into a perfect relationship with God. That is a perfect miracle. It only could be done through our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. But first is salvation. Then is our justification. All part, of, all part of grace. Election also. Faith and the spiritual gifts that we have. And each and every one of us, by God's grace, have a spiritual gift. At least one. Some, are, some have multiple gifts. But what are those gifts? It's in our very walk. It's in the way we, it's in our very testimonies. It's in the way that we live. It can be in our own family. It can be a gift of, of, of help. So we have many that I know have that gift where they have a real gift of help, a real heart for others and are constantly helping and doing different things. It can be gifts in ministry. It can be different gifts, but we all are given gifts. And we need to recognize we're not just some number on a board that God puts up and says, you know, I need 1,376,000 and that's you. That's not how it works, is it? God knows each and every one of us so, so perfectly. And he created each of us in a very special place, in a very special time, in a very special set of circumstances. Even as we look into the world today and may be very discouraged with what we're seeing. If I look at the world, I can get very discouraged. I'm learning to start kind of softening my, my watching and turning things on. I want to be informed, but I've got to say it's so scary, I, I, it's so depressing, I should say, that I, I'm trying to learn to get a little bit, more, a little bit more away from it. I need to know it, but I don't need to know it that much. But at the same time, I do know the Lord knew all this before the world ever was, and this is the time that we're in. And I look back in history, I see this has happened over and over and over again with so many great civilizations. 
particularly when they're at where we are. This, this nation is ripe to be judged. So we see all of these things. But we are his children. And he has a very unique place for us in this time and in this place and in this situation and all that's going on. I haven't been out that much this year, but I haven't seen much Christmas anywhere. Really. I've seen hardly any major, uh, major scenes and things of that nature. You know, I'm just saying it's a whole different world than it was 40 years ago, 50 years ago when I was growing up. What a difference. Verse 18 goes on to say, No man has seen God at any time. The only begotten Son, which is in the bosom of the Father, He hath declared Him. We must remember that God is a spirit, as we see in John 4.24, when Jesus said, God is a spirit, and they that worship Him must worship Him in spirit and truth. No man was speaking about, no man has ever actually seen God in His essence, His spiritual being. Yet he assumes the visible form, even in the Old Testament. There's many times what we talk about where we have the, a, the, a theocratic appearance, which is where, where God appears to man in like a human form. We can see some of those. For example, one might be if we looked at Genesis 32:30, when Jacob called the name of the place, uh, a place at, at Pinnacle, uh, at Penel, he said, I have seen God face to face, and my life is preserved. That's when he had had wrestled with him all night. And then in Exodus, when Moses, Moses says, then went up Moses and Aaron and, and Naab and, and Abiathar and 70, and, 70, and 70 of the elders of Israel, and they saw the God of Israel, and there was under his feet, as it, as it, as it were, a paved work of sapphire stone, and as it were, the body of heaven in, in his clearness. But see, it talks about how they've seen him. But again, these were theophanic appearances, and we have many of those. David, so many other that we can mention throughout the scriptures we see. The point here is that Jesus, that Jesus is a man and is the Son of God, and we have the privilege of having known about him and his, and, and his revelation through his earthly pilgrimage in this world itself, of his very words, of his very person of those that could testify of who he is. And as you're here as a child of God, you have in here. Remember as we talked last week, we talked about God the Father, God the Spirit, and God the, and God the Son, right? And we talked about how if you have God the Father, God the Son, or God the Spirit, when you go to pray, how many are you praying to? You're praying to all of them, aren't you? So if we go to Jesus and we're praying to Jesus and somebody says, well, what about, you know, it's, it's the same. Remember, they're all one. There isn't anything that one doesn't know that the other one doesn't know. They're all the same. So we see God in Jesus. Yes, again, his glory was set aside, but never his deity, but he was there. And we got to, the world got to really see God. And through that, we had the reverse side of that. We should have been able to see as we looked at this, the purity that we had over here, the righteousness that we had over here, the horror we should have been able to look on the other side and see of the world, the sin, the, the disgust of it, the, the, the sin of it. What a contrast. That's why the world hated him. He was doing good, wasn't he? He was offering life unto a dead world. And they hated him for it. He had good things to say and he did good things. And they hated him for it. You see, men love power. They love darkness more than light, the Bible teaches us. But we see it. The Pharisees, the Sadducees were so afraid of upsetting the apple cart in their own positions, their own positions of power. They were afraid of what real truth really was. What they claimed to do. But it wasn't new with Jesus. Did they not do the same thing to the prophets before? Did they not in most cases hate their own prophets, destroy them and kill their own prophets? It wasn't anything new. This is the way of the world. We have to be concerned about that because it's in our world too. In quote, religion Yes, there are those that are out in religion to destroy what is truly God. Remember, there is a truth, and there's only one truth, and that is the truth is Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ said, I am the way, the truth, and the word, and the life. There knoweth, 
And no one comes unto the Father except by me. There's only one truth. John points out in 14a, he says, Philip said unto him, we look, look here and, and we wonder about this scene of God and notice what Jesus says himself when Philip said unto him, Lord, show us the Father and it sufficeth us. And we look in verse 14.9 and Jesus says unto him, Have I been so long with you and yet thou hast not known me, Philip? He that hath seen me hath seen the Father. He that hath seen me has seen the Father. And how say thou then, show us the Father? Again, what is meant? Is not one, not necessarily one that has seen the, no one has ever seen really the essence of God. But keep in mind with Jesus Christ. We have with Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ is the essence of God. And not only was he the essence of God, unlike the prophets and everyone that was before him, where God spake to them and told them things to tell about others, to tell him about himself, Jesus Christ was more. He fully knew God. He could speak because he knew him. He was him. But he was dependent upon God the Father, wasn't he? As the perfect man, as we're to depend upon God, Jesus showed us in his life how we were to walk. How we were to look to the, look, look to the Lord, look to, to, to God to lead us and guide us through prayer, through study, through doing what was right, through based upon God's word. But he fully knew him. Jesus could speak and say what he said because he knew it. It was always true. Fully knew it. Prophets had what God had told them, but they didn't truly know God, did they? Not truly, anywhere close to where Christ did. We think about our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, and we think about the Word, and the Bible talks about that in John here. We need to realize the greatness of what, what we really have and what is being disclosed unto us through, through, through Him and through His wonderful Word that, he's, that we have today. You see, Jesus knew God as His equal, didn't He? Did He? Did Jesus know God as His equal? Was, was Jesus God's equal? He was, wasn't He? Because he's, he's, He was one. He was one with God. And He understood Him fully, His nature and all. As, it, as the dispensation of grace begins... With the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ, that's where we begin to grace with the dispensation of grace. The point of testing is no longer legal law obedience as a condition of salvation as under the law. But acceptance or rejection of Jesus Christ with good works is the fruit of that salvation. You, my friends, if you're here as a child of God there this morning, there should be evidence in our life of that, of, that trans, of, of that that's taking place in our life, shouldn't there be? There should be good works in our life. There should be things that, that come out of that. Why? Because I'm a new creation in Christ. And God has given me more of the mind of Him. And it should be now more and more in my nature as I grow in that abundant grace that we started with here this morning. As I grow in that grace that I begin to bring fruit forth because it is in my nature to do so. It is in my nature to, 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 to walk with the Lord and to share the wonderful person that I am. If I, in my own family, I often talk about my wife. Why is that? She's part of my life, isn't she? I share what goes on and I think so much about that and it's part of who I am. My kids, my grandkids, all of them are all part of my life. Is the Lord, when we go to come to Him, we should become, as we have already learned, we should be in His, we are, we are children of God. We see that we are now in the family of God. And we should walk as the family of God. And understand that in the family that we're in, we have nothing to fear. There is no power in this world. Why? My father created it all. It's, you know, what can, what can they do? This world is nothing. He's going to throw it away in essence. You know, think about that just a minute. If this world, and we can look and appreciate the beauty and what we see in the world and the magnificent balance, we've talked about all that. 
and think of how wonderful this is. Can we even begin to imagine what heaven is really going to be like? Wow. We can't even begin to imagine. That's our home. That's where we really have our, our place. We're just ambassadors here. In John 3.36 it says, He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life, and he that believeth not on the Son, please just the other side of that, shall not see life. But the wrath of God abideth on him. Now in verse 19 it goes on to say, and this is the record of John. When the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, Who art thou? And he confessed, and denied not, but confessed, I am not the Christ. And thou ask him, What then? Art thou Elijah? And he said, I'm not. Art thou that prophet? And he answered, No. Then said they unto him, Who art thou? That we may give an answer to them that sent us. What sayest thou of thyself? Now, who is the John that we're talking about right here? John the Baptist. Okay, I just thought about that. I'm kind of saying John all the time. It's the Gospel of John. Am I talking about which one? Okay, everybody knows. Okay, we're talking about John the Baptist. Now, this is the record of John. We've already learned that John the Baptist came for what? A witness, right? That was the special mission. He was the messenger. He was the, he was the, the, the heralder of, of the Lord that was already pre-promised and pre-told in the, no test, in, the, in the Old Testament. Pastor Joe pointed that out in his lesson, I think, last Sunday or the Sunday before. But anyway, he'd already pointed all of that out and brought out that whole thing. We won't do that again. But we now learn what his testimony, what his testimony regarding Jesus is. And we see something here. This is the first time in this epistle we see the word Jews. And sometimes many of us will think of Jews like this. When I think of the Jews, I think of the of, of, of Israel, the whole people, right? Well, the Jews here really has a little different condemnation. It really refers to the religious leadership of that day, the power of that day, not the Jewish people per se. And we see that in various things. Uh, some I didn't pull up the particular scriptures, but I was thinking of where um, I think when Jesus had healed the man and given him his uh, ability to walk, and they came, and he, he said how he feared or his parents feared the Jews. Well, he was a Jew himself, and his parents were Jews. But they feared the Jews. Who was he talking about? He was talking about the leadership of that day, the Jewish leadership. And that's kind of the content of what we're looking at here. So it says that. And uh, so what we see is John the Baptist said, I am not the Christ. And please notice how he emphasizes this. And told the Jewish leadership that he was not. Because he didn't want any focus upon himself. Remember when we looked at John the Baptist last week and how we talked about Jesus said there was none greater among women than John the Baptist. And we said what made John, we believe what we can see there that made John so the Lord could say that about him was his character. Was his character. His perfection in keeping what God had purposed for him to come into this world to do. He was he had one purpose, and that was all that he saw. He never saw himself in that sense. He never saw himself. Of course, if you look at all the miracles concerning him. We're not going to do that. Again, Pastor Joe already talked about that. But in John 26, 126, we see, and Jesus answered. Now let me finish this one thought here. He ministered, and his whole point was to point everyone to who? The Messiah. The Messiah that they had all been looking for, he had come and he was pointing them all to that wonderful truth. So John completely rejects their claim. He said, I'm not the Messiah. The Messiah is among them though, as we see in John 26 when it says, John answered them saying, I baptize with water. But there standeth, please notice, there standeth one among you whom ye know not. He's telling them right there that the Messiah Himself is with them right then. The Messiah has come. The one that you all are seeking and asking me if I am, I'm not. But the one that is has come. And He's here. In verse 27, 
He goes on to say, He it is who came after me is preferred before me, whose shoe latches I'm not worthy to unloosen. You see, he confesses and denies not. He quickly dismisses that he was the Messiah. Again, bringing no glory to himself. He sought only to glorify and be a witness to God who had sent him. And they said, well, are you Elijah then? You know, it might, have been, it might have been easy for the priests and the Levites from Jerusalem to associate John with Elijah because of his personality and because of the promise that Elijah would come before the day of the Lord in Malachi chapter 4. But John was careful to never say of himself that he was Elijah. <clears throat> Yet Jesus, please notice, Jesus noted in the sense that John was Elijah, in that he ministered in the office and in the spirit of Elijah. Remember, that's what Jesus said. Not John, but Jesus said that about him. Matthew eleven thirteen 13, and 14, and Mark 9, 11 through and 13. Then he said, well, are you the prophet? In Deuteronomy 18, 15, 19, God promises that another prophet would come in due time. Based on this passage, they expected another prophet to come and wondered if John was not he. Now, in John 23, he said, please us what he says. He said, I am the voice of one crying in the wilderness. That fulfills prophecy. Making straight the way of the Lord, as said the prophet Elijah. And they which were sent of the Pharisees, and they asked him and said unto him, Why baptize thou then, if thou be not that Christ or Elijah, neither that prophet? And John answered them, saying, I baptize with water, but there standeth one among you, you know not. And he it is who cometh after me is preferred before me, whose shoes latches I am not worthy to unloosen. These things were done in Bethbartha beyond Jordan, where John was baptizing. Yes, he was the one. The, the voice crying in the wilderness is pointed out in Isaiah 43, four verses, I mean 40, chapter, chapter 40 and verse 3 where he would, was going to be prepared, he would be the one that would be preparing the way. He baptized in preparation, cleansing them for the coming of the king. John's real function was, to teach, was not to teach ethics, but to point men to Jesus when he said, make straight the way of the Lord. It is a call to be ready for the coming of the Messiah, for the Messiah is near. Religious leaders wanted to know who John was. John was really wasn't interested in answering that question. He simply wanted to do one thing, focus on his, mission, on his mission and prepare the way for the Messiah. They said, why then do you baptize if you're not Christ? The Pharisees wondered about John's authority if he was actually one of the, prophet, of the, of the prophesied ones that they had in mind. Yet John worked to baptize perfectly suited his calling as he explained. His baptism was apparently distinctive in his administration and, and, and personally. It was not self-administered as, as a proselyte Baptist. John talked about doing it with water. <clears throat> water was, <clears throat> was what was used in the Old Testament for purification. And it had to do with, it, with that aspect of it. But it, to the Jew, baptism wasn't, was such a was, was such that they would never have it done. You see, to the Jew, they kind of believed because they were Jews, they were, already, they were already saved. They didn't need anything else. So what John was doing was bringing them to light that they were not. And John was helping them to understand this very important truth. They only saw it as a Gentile when a Gentile wanted to become a, a proselyte and become a Jew and, and accept in the Jewish religion. They need to go through this process, which was kind of taken part, part of what was, I think, taken out of the Old Testament as a way to purify. But to the Jew, that was a horrible thing to have. It was very hard for them to accept that or receive that. So that was really a big step for a Jew to do that in those days. It's good for us to keep that in mind. Yes, I think that we see that, and we also need to understand when it says in 26, and John answers saying, I baptize with water, but there stands one among you that ye know not. John explains that the religious leaders, the, to the religious leaders, that he was not from, from, uh, from his works, but one who was already among them. 
And John's work was to prepare the way for him. In verse 27, he says this. We're going to close with this morning because we're out of time. It says, he it was coming, uh, he, he, he it was who's coming after me is preferred before me, whose shoe latches I am not worthy to unloosen. We see the humbleness once again of John the Baptist. And I want you to think about this just a minute. In the Jewish tradition of the, of the, of the Pharisees and, and Sadducees, where they had their teachers, the teachers were way up here, and then they had their students, which were way down here. And the students were expected to become servants to them during, the, during that time. And they were expected to do all kinds of things as servants. You know the one thing they weren't expected to do? Was to wash the feet. Was to wash their feet. To do their feet of anything. That was too low for anyone to do. That was the lowest, lowest of, of servitude that one could, could be humble to. And yet, John points out in this message, he tells them, remember, they thought he was the Messiah. They thought he was the prophet. They thought he was a, they had all these positions for him. He's telling them that he's not even worthy. He is not even worthy to unloosen the, the sandals of, of the one. That is who it is. He was humbled. He understood that the Messiah is the Messiah. He is God. And you cannot be humble enough before God. The, the understanding of understanding who we need to see when we see Jesus, if we can get that light in our mind a little bit of really the one that came and gave so much for us, gave all for us, what a blessing it is to know that we are children of God here this morning and that we have a purpose we have reason. God has put us here in this particular time and place, this particular family that we have right here. Oh, let us be about our Lord's business. Let us not be discouraged. God's going to humble us. God's, God's going to help us to walk in his, in his light if we'll seek it out. With that, I'm going to go ahead and close. Pastor, would you close this morning, please, brother?